Hello, I'm uh, Sergio Troncoso, and uh, let me start first by telling you a little bit about my personal journey. So I grew up uh, in El Paso, uh, Texas, in Isleta, which is a neighborhood on the east side of El Paso. And both my parents were uh, Mexican. Uh, they had just come over from Chihuahua, from Juarez. And so I grew up within a quarter mile from the Mexican border where everyone spoke Spanish. And uh, it was very poor. It was a colonia, which really means a shanty town. We did not have uh, running water. We built our own adobe house. And uh, we even moved into the half finished house before the windows were in because um, hoodlums were stealing our copper piping. So we had to move in as we built the house and my father um, and friends of his uh, built the house as we, as we lived there. So uh, that's, that's, you know, my beginning is, is really in many ways very typical of, uh, atypical of where I ended up, which is the Ivy League. So, so for me that the beginning first, uh, speaking Spanish at home uh, and also being extremely poor, uh, poor enough that of course we qualified for food stamps and, and welfare, but my parents would not accept it because they, they thought it was shameful. So they were very uh, adamant about that. And, and, you know, having to dig an outhouse, I don't know how many writers have, have dug outhouses behind their, their first home, but that's how we began. And so that culture of doing it yourself, of working to survive, of also living in a Mexican neighborhood, not Mexican American, not Hispanic, not Latino, it was Mexicano. People had just crossed over last week, last month, last year, and it was in the middle of the desert um, in the outskirts of El Paso. And, and it was a struggle, but it was also an adventure. And I think that's one of the things when you're growing up in that uh, neighborhood that you, you realize that, you know, you had so much independence. You could walk out and go fishing in the canal behind their house. Um, I could walk for miles into cotton fields um, and not be disturbed. And, and everybody was also like me. So that also had an impact on me uh, later in life because uh, when I ended up at Harvard and then went to Yale as a graduate student, um, but at Harvard, I remember people telling me, well, you don't act like a minority. Uh, and, I, and I always pondered what that meant. You know, I didn't act sheepish. I didn't act um, like I didn't, try to belong, although it was very difficult for me to belong in a place I did not understand, uh, like Harvard. But what it, I think what it meant is I never really grew up with that sense of being in the minority because I was the majority in El Paso. Uh, all the people, whether they were poor, whether they were rich, or some, somewhere in between, 80% or so, were Mexicanos or Mexican Americans. And since you're right next to Mexico, you also have that interaction repeatedly with Mexico. My parents and I and my brothers and my sister would go to Sunday dinner in Juarez, which is right across the international bridge. Every Sunday, we'd have uh, mariscos at Via del Mar, you know, fish and, and all sorts of things because my father was a big aficionado of, 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 of fish and so was my mother. And so it, going back and forth to Mexico back then was very easy. And since these cities, Juarez and El Paso were really right next to each other, separated by a little canal that is called the Rio Grande. Uh, that was a, the bicultural, binational, bilingual living that I became accustomed to. So when I went to Harvard and I was admitted to Harvard and I, I got there, it shocked me that not everyone 
in the United States was bilingual or uh, understood another language or had grown up um, the way I did, it shocked me that I knew so little about from the first uh, of where, where you go eat. Uh, my parents, for example, did not uh, take me to Harvard. I, I, I went by myself. I had actually never visited the school or the state of Massachusetts before uh, I left El Paso. And so it was from, from the very basics of how you get to, to, to Cambridge from Logan Airport to uh, what is this university? In fact, I remember when the cab driver uh, was bringing me from Logan to, to Cambridge, and that was the first time I had been there, I thought he was kidnapping me. Uh, I, I, you know, it sometimes happened in Mexico and I thought, and I asked him like, why are you taking me to a park? And he said, no, this is not a park. This is the school. Harvard University is all around us. We're driving into Harvard Yard. And so in my mind as a border kid who grew up in El Paso and Isleta, I never imagined that a university would be so green, would be in the middle of what I considered to be a park. And uh, I didn't imagine that all these buildings around me were the university. I'd never been there. I, I, I had no idea. And I think I vaguely had seen pictures of, of the school in a catalog because of course back then in, in, the, uh, in the late 70s, there was no internet, uh, or at least we weren't, we certainly didn't have enough money to have internet. So in many ways I was clueless upon arriving and I was frightened and culture shocked. Um, and uh, I, you know, I showed up wearing jeans, um, bells, bell bottom jeans, and I have only t-shirts, um, everything from America, the band to, uh, Led Zeppelin t-shirts to uh, all sorts of other rock groups uh, that I liked. I literally had no, not a single dress shirt. And in fact, this, this, this button down Oxford is a uniform I adopted after living uh, at, in Harvard Square for four years as my, uh, as my undergraduate days, you know, continued. So, so that's sort of my beginning and some of the struggles that I had to, to deal with. But, but in, in reality, you know, the, the main issue was this cultural linguistic adjustment to, to places uh, that were so far away in so many ways, not just geographic, but uh, in so many ways from where I grew up. Uh, I knew poverty. Poverty was always around me and I took it for granted. It had also made you tougher to survive poverty. So I was used to working all the time for my father and his construction projects. And, and I translated that work ethic that, in, um, and I mean, we were working Saturdays and Sundays. I mean, we worked, uh, we would get home from school at 3.30 and by five o'clock or 4.30, we had to be at my parents' construction project, either at the house or in, in, in things that he would, he would uh, be involved in as a construction engineer. So I learned to work. And then after that, after I got home at seven or eight or 9 p.m., I would do my homework. So this, this day of, of being maybe a 15 hour day routinely was normal for me. And so this work ethic that is uh, so important to, to how I ended up was started by my family and by my father and by my mother who just believed in you work until you drop. You get up and you do it again the next day. And that becomes your pace. It's a relentless, terrific pace of, of focusing your mind and your body to do what other people won't do. And, and that's what they taught me, these Mexican immigrant values that I took to Harvard. So when I got to Harvard and I had no clue, I didn't even know where the cafeteria was. I just followed people to, to see where they ate and, uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, the union, this work ethic 
you know, taught me to work until the libraries closed at Harvard, to work on Saturdays and Sundays when my peers in Hollis Hall, which was my, my dormitory freshman year, uh, when they were partying, I was out at the library working because I was terrified. I was terrified that I would fail. I was terrified that all the sacrifices my parents made for me to get to Harvard, that all those uh, sacrifices would be in vain if I returned um, a failure. So for me, it was, I'd rather drop dead from exhaustion than fail. And, and I also remembered calling uh, my grandmother. My grandmother was a very important figure in my life, probably the most important figure in my early life. Um, she, her name was Doña Dolores Rivero. She was my mother's mother. And she had shot and killed two men who attempted to rape her during the Mexican Revolution. And she was this tough as nails woman who lived in El Segundo Barrio in downtown El Paso. And she had grit, she had spunk, she had, I will, ne will not be dominated by anybody. And in her house, she controlled everything, including my grandfather. And if my grandfather did not give her his money that he earned at the gardener, uh, she would take a broomstick and hit him on the head with it. I mean, she was tough. My parents were scared of her and she was like, we were not close together. We were simpatico. So I would, I would, uh, as a kid, I would drive all the way. Uh, well, I would bike actually about 15 miles from Isleta all the way to downtown El Paso to spend weekends with her and hear these great violent stories about the Mexican Revolution when she was a teenager and how she survived and how she, you know, uh, did in her life. Um, as a kid there, and, and these, these great violent stories that of course any kid would love. But when I was at Harvard and I wanted to quit and I felt out of place and everyone said I had an accent, um, I called her and I remember that first week I was crying. I said, you know, nobody here speaks Spanish and everyone says I have an accent and I don't feel like I belong. And my grandmother, uh, you know, over the phone said, Sergio, don't come back with your tail between your legs. This is what you wanted. Show them who you are. And so I, I have never forgotten those words. You know, she was um, an inspiration and she was the backbone of our family. And so for me, uh, that really began my effort to fight back. So she didn't know what Harvard was. She didn't know what the Ivy League was. I think she had a third grade education, but she had survival instincts. She knew how to survive in a tough situation because of how she grew up in the Mexican Revolution. So this sense of grit, this sense of toughness, this sense of fighting back, that's what she imparted to me. And so the very first story I ever wrote at the graduate student at Yale was called the Abuelita, which is called the grandmother. It's about this um, Mexican American at, uh, at Yale calling his, his grandmother, his Mexican grandmother, and arguing about Heidegger's um, philosophy of being towards death. Uh, so I, at that point at Yale, I was heavily into the German philosophers, and I and I learned German to study them. So for me, I was breaking all these barriers breaking these barriers of what Chicano literature, Mexican-American literature should be. You know, I wanted to see um, the literature of, of my neighborhood, of the border uh, on, the, on the page, in the libraries at Harvard. And I didn't see a lot of that. Um, and that was my primary motivation to become a writer, to start writing the stories that connected the ideas and concepts I learned at places like Harvard and Yale with the people, the characters, like my grandmother, like my parents, like my brothers and my sister and people like them in the neighborhoods and characters I would create in my head. That was the primary motivation for me to become a writer. 
um, to get these stories, the important discussion that occurred in, on the, in these border families, to get them into literature, to get them into the libraries. So I'm going to stop right there and I'll continue in a second. Let me uh, talk a little bit about my writing process. So I, I believe in writing on multiple, uh, working on multiple projects at the same time. That has always worked for me. And so I am sometimes working on very short stories uh, or essays, something that 15, 20 pages or so. And at the same time that I'm working on a memoir or at the same time that I'm working on a novel, which is a much longer uh, marathon, so to speak. And, and that's, that kind of work uh, has allowed me to always stay busy. Because I, one of the things I've learned about myself is that the more I have to do, the more I actually get done. So, so for me, my day is most productive in the morning when I am starting new work, work that I'd never, uh, something from a first draft. I typically start very early in the morning, let's say around seven or eight in the morning, and I write at, until I get exhausted, three or four hours, typically. And, and then I take a break for either lunch or, or a late breakfast. And then in the afternoon, I might look over what I just did, but typically I leave it alone and I edit something I've already worked on, something I did maybe a week ago or a month ago or a longer project. And that, that begins the process in the, in the afternoon. So I, I typically work on things I've already done that I'm, um, you know, that, that, that I'm working on. And I think my rationale that has worked for me is, is when I'm editing, I need a separation between me and my work to be able to be brutal um, on, on my own work, to look at my work as an, with an editor's hat and to look at it from a reader that has not written that. So it, it's sort of a, a, almost like a lie you tell yourself uh, to be able to be a, a very good editor of your own work. But I need that separation. So I, I, I never edit anything that I just wrote because I don't have that separation. You know, when you write a first draft, you think, oh, this is the best thing since sliced cheese, of course, um, but it's not. And so you need that separation. I typically put another work or two or three works in between the work I actually edit in the afternoon. So it, it may be something I wrote two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And, and I don't have that, that emotional connection to, to the work. And that allows me to be brutal and, and difficult and, and ask questions about every line, every paragraph, every chapter that I, that I am editing in the afternoon. And I think uh, that's one of the things I learned as a, you know, as a writer as I got older, uh, how to become a better editor of your own work. Uh, I think the other, uh, so that, that sort of just to run you through my day. So I typically write new stuff in the morning. I edit old, older things in the afternoon. And then in, after I, I'm exhausted from editing, I might work on contracts or work on uh, events or, or booking events uh, right before dinner, right after dinner. Uh, the things that were not necessarily creative, but it's still the business of writing. And then at night I read, I read until I have to go to sleep, um, three, four, five hours. Uh, you know, if you want to be a, a good writer, you have to be a voracious, targeted reader. And what I mean by that is that you should be reading for a purpose. You should be reading because you're trying to understand maybe the narrative flow of Tolkien, or you're trying to understand uh, the dialogue um, and word choice of Zora Neale Hurston, or you're trying to 
uh, appreciate you know the moral quality, the moral questions that are subtly introduced by somebody like Faulkner into his his work. You know, it's reading for a purpose, reading to dissect the craft of some other great writer, and and understand that craft and 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 take it apart, and and see what you can use for your own. So. So I, I, I am reading because I enjoy and I love many of these writers and other writers, but I'm also reading for a purpose to try to learn something new that I don't know. And so that's my typical day, um, you know, and, and, you know, to give you a sense of, of um, you know, of my process. And, and it, I find that when I do that and I keep that pace day after day, I very rarely get writer's block um, because the reading will inspire new ideas. The reading will also help the new writing that I do in the morning. Uh, the editing makes me sharper when I start writing something new in the morning as well. So they, these different aspects of my daily life influence each other all the time. And, and you know, I even work sometimes on Saturdays, but I try to do something different Saturday and Sunday, something physical, something, get out there and, and, and work out, simply to open my mind and get out of the rut of, of simply sitting uh, on the, you know, and working all the time or, or reading. Because I, I, I find that things like bicycling and, and, and jogging and walking, I walk often five miles a day or maybe three, three and a half to four miles a day. Um, open my mind and I actually am thinking about problems and issues that I had in my work as I am exercising. But it's a, a sort of a liberation to be using your body and, and taking your mind off things. And in a way that taking your mind off things inspires you and gives you a solution to a problem that you couldn't solve by simply sitting in front of the computer. So, so I think you have to be very self-aware as a writer about your own perspective and your own biases. So if you're sitting too much in, a, in front of a computer and, and not really doing any research in the field, you gotta do that. You gotta work towards you know, that medium of doing more things out there to understand uh, and appreciate and improve your own writing. If on the other hand, you're not doing enough sitting on your ass time, working, pounding out those words, you got to do more of that. If you're staying within your community too too much, and not understanding what other people um, are are facing and, and the the struggles that they're facing, you got to get out there and get into the community and talk to people, and listen to them carefully, simply to understand motivations of what you're trying to write, perhaps on the page at home. So, so I think uh, this self-awareness as a writer of your own biases, of your own uh, perspective, the limitations of your own perspective and how to overcome those limitations, how to keep inspiring your own curiosity, all of this will help your writing. It'll also help you to be a better thinker about what you should write in the first place. So, so that's sort of a, a, uh, a snippet into my writing process and how I think. So let me stop the tape right here and I'll continue in a few minutes. So let me turn now to this question of support and guidance and inspiration. And, and you know, do I ever get discouraged? Absolutely. Uh, you know, if you are gonna be a writer, you're gonna get rejected. Even if you've published many books like I have, even if you have um, won awards, you know, like I have and many other writers, you know, you'll get rejected. So you have to be tough, I think, inside. And, you know, it, there's no question that often you, you send something in and you've worked on it for years and you feel it's terrific. And, and, you know, it comes back, they feel it's crap, or it gets rejected 20 different times by 20 different journals. And you don't, you know, you start questioning yourself, you know, did I, did I waste my life doing this? Did I, 
uh, you know, what did I do? What did I do wrong? Am I really getting, am I getting worse instead of better as a writer? Um, you know, you always imagine that you're progressing and becoming better, but maybe you're not. So of course, this, these kinds of self-doubts are always there. And, and I think the way I combat them is first by these, this multiple project strategy. Um, I always have short stories, essays, novels, memoirs in the works or in the middle of it, or I have a few things out. So invariably, I might get dozens of rejections, but one thing will go through to a great review like the Yale Review or the Michigan Quarterly Review, you know, these reviews that are really tough to get into. And that gives you that little impetus to, you know, I'm not all crap. You know, I am getting okay. You know, I am okay as a writer. Maybe I am getting a little better. Um, you, you have to keep your humility about you. The writing um, business is a tough business and and you have to keep working, even if you get rejected, even if you get discouraged. And, and I think this multiple project, not sitting around waiting for your novel to be picked up, write another one. Start a draft of a third one, or write a memoir as you're w waiting for two novels to come up. Keep working, keep producing different works. Keep also thinking, what did I do wrong and rewriting what you, or you, what you may have already sent out so that you are improving even before you get the response from the editor or the journal of the work you sent in. So I think that's my mentality. It's multiple projects, always keep working and always keep sending things out, but always be self-aware of what are your limitations and how do you improve, for example, your dialogue in your work? How do you improve plot structure or how do you improve your word choice and paragraph formation? So, you know, you never get too comfortable with your, your abilities, even though your abilities may be eons uh, from where you started as a graduate student at Yale writing philosophical stories. Um, you you will be better, but but you know I think the a, a really good writer never stops learning, never stops improving, never stops questioning uh, yourself ab about how to get better, how to try something new, how to um, improve um, what you're doing. And I don't really have a support group. I mean, I have friends who. I've, I've had writer friends who are really great writers, uh, terrific, won terrific prizes and produced great books. And, and, you know, I'm lucky to call them my friends and I'm not going to name any, any of them, but, but, you know, they're this group of four or five or six writers that uh, occasionally talk to me and, and, and send me emails. And, and I think that that helps a lot. Uh, I would say my biggest support group, but it's not really a support group. It's really just a group of, of my literary posse, as I call them. It's the Texas Institute of Letters. It's uh, a, an organization, literary organization that started in 1936, run by writers, supported by writers. And, and we give, you know, $23,000 of prizes every year to you know, to first best first novel, best novel, best poetry collection, best picture book, best young adult book, et cetera. And, and I'm currently the president of that organization. And it has great phenomenal writers in, it, in its uh, membership. And so that group is sort of a constant source of uh, exchanges of ideas and friendships and, and, and people that I admire and that I ask for advice from. So, but it's not, it's not really a support group. I, I don't think they're, you know, writers sort of are somewhat of an ornery, independent, loner type bunch. And so I, I don't really look to them for support. Most of the support has to come from you and your family and, 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 and then maybe a few writers will have that mentality of being really good people who want to help others. Uh, but most writers are by themselves, working by themselves, and are not necessarily 
you know, the touchy feely, let me hug you, um, you know, while you work through your novel draft, you know, writers aren't going to do that. Um, they, they're typically kind of kick your ass a little bit. And that in itself is their version of support. They say, you know, get to it or, you know, or you exchange manuscripts with a few of, of, my, of my friends. And, and our job is really to kick the ass of the other writer. And they're, they're really good friends of mine, but they tell me what the problems are. They tell me what doesn't sound right. And I do the same thing with their manuscripts. And that is actually a form of support, although it, it seems like tough love, but that's exactly what it is. They, uh, I'm enlisting them because I admire their work. They're willing to read two to 300 pages of my work. And I do the same thing for them and give them copious notes and, and responses. And I try to be honest. I'm not trying to be their friend. I'm trying to tell them, this is a problem. Before you send it to your editor, fix this problem. So, so that's the kind of support group and inspiration I get. And, and it took me a while, by the way. I think I had to become older. Can you see the gray hair? <laughs> and, more, and more mature um, to accept that kind of help, to believe that these people, there are a few people in the world, whether they are editors or whether they are other writers, colleagues, who are kicking your ass, but it's actually good for you. And it's good for you to listen to them and, and see that the problem that they're telling you about, they may not tell you how to fix it, but they will help you identify it. And then it's your job to find a way, given your vision for the work, to fix this problem or to address this issue. And so it, 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 took, you know, it took me getting a little older and wiser to accept that kind of criticism. Uh, because of course, as a young writer, you feel I am always right and I, I'm the, gonna be the next Faulkner or whoever, the next Garcia Marquez. And, and, and of course they're not. Um, and, and it takes you a while to get that perspective, to, to, to sense, uh, you know, your own failings so that you can improve them. And then also to open yourself to other people, a few individuals that you trust and say, look at this, tell me what you really think. And then I'll do the same thing for your manuscript. And that's actually a support that's very beneficial. It hurts. <laughs> and, um, you know, uh, it hurts. But on the other hand, when they say this is good, you know, it is good because uh, not only did you feel it in your, in your bones before you sent it to them, but if they are, they're telling you and you know who, what kind of persons they are, that they really never pull any punches, uh, that confirmation makes a huge difference. And, and really propels you forward in a way. So it's sort of a different type of support and imp inspiration than, than kind of the warm, touchy-feely, let me hug you. Um, you know, it's, it's more of a tough love support. Um, so let me, let, let me just keep going. Um, one of the other questions that, um, that you had here in terms of supporting guidance is, where do you draw my inspiration? So, you know, my inspiration comes from really being actively, aggressively curious about the world, about people, and about really being a vehicle, not, not imposing your own will. Of course, it's your mind and your perspective, et cetera, from, in my case, growing up extremely poor and, and then, you know, growing up on the border bilingual and then jumping to Harvard and Yale and that, that huge leap and what, what happened to me. But it's also about trying to learn from other people and listening to them. So I, I get a lot of inspiration simply by listening and paying attention to people. And, and by the way, most of them are not writers at all. Simply to understand the character motivation, you have to be interested in people. You have to be looking at why do people do these things? And you talk to them and you listen. And, and most of the of it is listening very aggressively and asking questions and hoping they don't say, get the hell out of here. I don't want to answer any more of your questions. But it, it's about this aggressive curiosity that, that I think you have to hone as a writer. You have to be interested in 
the bugs that are walking by you as you're taking your three, four mile walk every day, the, the birds around you and what's going on and how they're seeing the world, how they're actually communicating with each other, the, the people you meet on your walks and, and what they're talking to you about and um, you know the little either um, jealousies they have or the, the little um, fears they have and just being attentive to, to the world around you and asking questions and really being a vehicle to try to understand it. And so, so for me, that's where I draw my inspiration. If I am sitting in front of a computer and I'm getting nothing done and I don't know what to do, I get out there. I go out of my room. I go take a walk. I go visit some friends. I go do some work for other people. And, and then I listen and, and invariably I find a story or I find something really fascinating that I never thought about or a, a subject that I never really encountered and I wanna learn more. So that prompts my curiosity. So, so I think any writer, you, know, you can't just sit in front of your computer. That's what you do most of the time when you're writing, but to get inspiration, I think you need to get out there and you, you need to be professionally curious, you know, uh, aggressively curious, even as you get older. So, you know, don't assume that you know everything. Don't start looking at the world with what I call cliche ready eyes. So that you assume, oh, I know what that kind of person is like, or I know what that kind of uh, situation is that, or that kind of worker is like, because you don't. And I think that mentality starts closing you to uh, a new experience, a new person, um, and, and you have to be aggressively curious. I think one of my favorite books is uh, by Alexander Horowitz, which I think it's called um, On Looking. And this, this, this woman who's a Columbia, I think a Columbia professor, took 13 experts, I think it was 13 or 15 experts around the same Manhattan block, uh, a, a, an expert on geography, an expert on buildings. She took her child, I think four or five year old child around the block to see what they would see, what they would focus on, a bug expert. And every single time she saw something new going around the same Manhattan block. And that's what I, I actually am a creature of habit. The, the four, four or five mile walk I take, it's pretty much the same in most places, whether I'm in Connecticut or in New York City. And every single time I see something different. So if you are walking or discussing or meeting people and you are have closed your mind and are not being open to this person you've experienced, um, many, may, perhaps many times, you've met this person many times, but you're looking for something new. You're trying to really see how Christina has changed today or how um, someone else that you just met, you know, is very new and gives you a different w way of looking at the world or, 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 or teaches you something. So that's what you, you have to fight against uh, what I would call sort of the self, the, the, the visual and moral encrustation of your age so that you stop, you know, you're, you're so ready to close your eyes and to assume you know this person, even though you've, you know, you've interacted with them, let's say for 30 years. Um, and if you are doing that, you're not looking anymore. You're not being curious anymore. So I, you know, my wife, Laura, um, I, we've been together, uh, we're actually celebrating our 30th anniversary, but we were together seven years before we got married. So I, I, you know, we've been in close proximity for 37 years. She still surprises me every day. There's still something that I find so revelatory. And so I think you have to keep looking like that every day at, at your surroundings, your, your walks, the people you meet to see what they can teach you, what they can show you, and then perhaps use some of that in your writing. So I think that's, that's part of where I draw my, my inspiration. Let me pause here for a moment. I'm gonna focus on this little segment on craft sustainability. 
<laughs> how do I sustain being a writer? Well, first of all is don't drop dead. You know, stay in relatively good physical shape so that your body and your mind are alert. And, um, and it, it is important. You know, the very first thing I tell my writing class is I, ha I will have a successful day of writing if I've had a good night's sleep. So for me, going to sleep early, getting a great night's sleep means I'm going to produce new work the next morning. And so that's sort of a very simple thing on, on sustaining yourself as, as a writer. But more globally, I've also told people, you have to set up your life to be a writer, to have the time to write, to ponder, et, et cetera. And, and I'll, I'll tell you a story because this is how, how it started for me. When I was a senior at Harvard and I, I started taking a lot of, in fact, I, I think I took just about every course on Latin America and Mexico offered in political science and history and even some in sociology and economics because I was trying to find out who I was. I, I had not been taught the history of Mexico or the history of Mexican Americans in El Paso or, or, or anywhere really in Texas high school. So I had to actually go to Harvard thousands of miles away to learn about who I was and where I was from and the, the, the context of my life and, and Mexican history and Texas history involved with Mexican history and Latin America and in, in the United States. So, and one of my mentors was John Womack, the chairman of the history department at Harvard. And he was a, a specialist on Mexican history. And he wrote one of the probably the best book in English on Latin American history called Zapata and the Mexican Revolution. And he was this tough as nails Marxist uh, guy from Oklahoma who wore cowboy boots at Harvard and didn't give a crap about Harvard pretension. He cared about the work he produced in his seminar. And he was chairman of the history department, a powerful figure and wrote great books. But the most unpretentious person I've ever met at Harvard as a professor. And so, uh, you know, and I became, and I worked my ass off in his seminars um, and did, you know, did really well. And I was once in his office, senior year at Harvard, and I told Professor Womack, why don't they have more, more courses on Mexican Americans at Harvard? Um, you know, there's nothing, or maybe there's one every two or three years. And he said, Sergio, open up the course catalog. And he pointed to a section of the course catalog and he said, why are there six courses on Armenian literature at Harvard? How many Armenians do you think there are at Harvard? It's probably less than one or 2%, you know, a tiny percent. Well, some, and he said, and he told me, Sergio, some rich Armenian industrialist gave millions of dollars to the school and said, if you want my money, you have to teach Armenian literature and Armenian culture in the school. That's why those courses exist. And I remember the, these next words forever. He said, Sergio, Harvard is a money machine. If you want courses on Chicano literature and Chicano history, get some rich person, whether it's a Chicano, a Mexican American, some, somebody else interested in that, to give them money, and that's how it'll happen. And so from that moment on, I knew senior year that I had to create my own little Harvard. And, and that really meant that if I wanted to be a writer, if I wanted to do what I wanted to do, and, and then, you know, not be in, ac in academia for a while, but then after a while, be able to succeed and exist outside of academia, I had to create my own situation to support myself as I became a better writer in time. And, and what it meant simply was next year after senior year, when I won the Fulbright, for example, suddenly I had all this money and I, and I won the Fulbright to study Mexican literature and, and economics and politics in Mexico City. And I spent less than half of that money. I actually lived in a, in a, you know, in a nice but not lavish 
uh, place in Mexico City. I did my research. I fulfilled all the Fulbright requirements, but I started learning how to invest money, how to use that Fulbright money instead of squandering it to build a nest egg so that as I got older, I could do what I wanted to do, which was to be a writer, have the space and the time to be a writer. And so, and that became my mantra as I went to Yale after the Fulbright and I won scholarships or, you know, and I worked at Yale, I would, I was a relentless saver. In fact, my wife uh, told me uh, at back, that time she was my girlfriend. She said, you live like a monk. I, my, my, at Yale, I had uh, as a bed, uh, cinder blocks that I had found on the street. I also found a piece of plywood and I took, put that piece of plywood on top of the cinder block. And then I bought a really cheap foam to put on top of the plywood and that was my bed. And yet I had one of the biggest bank accounts of any graduate student at Yale. And every scholarship, every loan, any extra money that I had, and I worked while I was a graduate student as well, I saved and I invested. And I learned as well, apart from taking more courses in philosophy and more courses in Mexican history, et cetera, I also learned how to invest. I taught myself accounting. I taught myself uh, economics. I mean, I, I, would, I actually worked as an economist briefly right after Yale because I wanted to create my own Harvard. I wanted to be able to tell any, bo any boss, you know, fuck you the hell with you. I hope that that edited out, but you know, I wanted to be able to do what I wanted to do as a writer and not be stuck um, having to, to lose a lot of time to um, do something that I didn't want to do or even compromise my literary work because of money. And so, so I learned to live frugally and invested and buy myself time to do what I wanted to do and to write the kind of work I wanted to write, whether or not that work became commercially successful. I wanted to write about the border and I wanted to write about characters from the border and I wanted to um, discuss philosophical questions that they discussed, but using the broader context of what I learned at Harvard and Yale. And some of this stuff sold extremely well, thousands of copies, tens of thousands of copies, and the other stuff was not, you know, meant for commercial success. And it didn't matter to me because from, from my point of view, creating this Harvard little endowment for myself through my hard work and, and relentless saving and living like a pauper, even though I didn't have to live like a pauper, meant literary freedom, meant I have freedom to write what I want, whether or not the market allows me or, or says yes to it. Um, and so that, those words from Womack were instrumental in creating, you know, what you might call craft sustainability. Because I know a lot of writers who, you know, have told me, and I won't mention any names, friends of mine who are very famous who says this not next novel of mine, they, they'll, they'll tell me has to sell a lot because I need money for my mortgage or I need money to, you know, pay my alimony or something. I don't ever want to be in that position where I am compromising my craft in order to make money. I want my, my work to be successful. I want my work to sell. And I want my work to open people's eyes to the border and to philosophical questions. Um, but I am not going to write for money. That will never be my primary motivation. I want, to, I want people to understand that I will not be bought. And one of the ways I, I can say that is because I bought myself. I, earn this money myself and I grew it to become something sustainable to protect my craft from these other influences that are there, always there in fact, to, to warp and change what you want to write and to, to compromise your life as a free thinker. I did not want that to happen. And so for me, that became a program 
35 years ago, before I was married, in fact, probably more like 40 years ago. And, and I was relentless about investing and about, and it was sort of a side gig. It was this other thing that, that really allowed me to be creative and free, uh, but without it, I don't think it would have worked. And so, and it all began with that conversation I had with John Womack as an undergraduate. And, I, and of course I had no money. It's not like somebody ever gave me the money. It was really just earning it and saving it and living with clothes that were often ratty and, and uh, you, know, um, you know, messed up. And, and I didn't care from my point of view was it, it was my freedom that was at stake. And so I was not going to compromise it by being an overspender, quite the opposite. I will, I will walk on my shoes until they have holes in them and then I'll, I'll buy new ones, uh, but not before. And, and I think a lot of people don't have that mentality. I think one of the last things that, that was asked um, was if I had three words of advice for people, I would say the first word is work. And that means work until you drop work to improve yourself, keep working even when you're getting rejected. So that first word, work. I think the second word is in curiosity, which means open your eyes to what you don't see. Know you, the limitations of your perspective and force yourself to look at things, to be with people so that you understand them better. Uh, if you don't understand them from the get-go, or you feel you don't understand them from the get-go. So work, curiosity, and I think the last thing is perseverance. You know, just like my abuelita, you know, grit, perseverance, don't give up. You're going to get your ass kicked. You know, I get my ass kicked probably, you know, routinely two or three times a week, but I do not give up. You know, I, I fight back. I fight back internally. I fight back with improving my craft and writing something that people will say, oh my God, this has never been done before. Oh my God, he's really doing something very unique. Um, I've never seen this. I've never seen this story. And so that in itself will be your power. So I would say those three, three words, work, curiosity, and perseverance. Um, so anyway, thank you for listening. I hope that was enough. I'm sure you can <laughs> edit it down and, uh, and let me know if you need anything else. Thank you.